everyone. Here is our asynchronous video about information books, aka nonfiction. Um, back when I was in elementary school, an information book was expected to provide everything a child might need to know on a subject. In other words, everything you would need if you're, you know, really interested in it and want to run away a paper about it. Um, and gradually, there's been a shift uh, away from that expectation um, so that uh, nowadays it's much more desirable uh, to write for a specific age and with the intention to whet the appetite. So the idea is that someone who is writing an information book um, knows, for instance, if it's actual size, that it's for uh, quite young children uh, for the most part, and, um, and it's not everything about each animal in this case. In that case, it's just uh, how big they are. And then there's a little extra information uh, in the back for, for adults. Um, so the expectation then is to uh, whet the appetite about the subject and then include more resources in the back of the book. Uh, and very often there is a section in much smaller print, uh, which is for the adults to read. Uh, so in the books we read for today, all those notes and things at the end, uh, those are so that an adult sharing these books uh, has the tools they would need to um, help a child who has additional questions. And um, it, it also provides uh, lists of additional books on these subjects. Um, and then uh, there's also been a, a trend uh, against books that just uh, give the information linearly uh, and instead uh, provide information in multiple ways so that the child can sort of dip into the book and uh, maybe first read the, the big print or the captions of the pictures or the sidebars or something um, and then go back and, uh, and read again. And this tends to be frustrating for teachers who uh, are usually more in the sort of linear text mode. Um, however, for, for visual learners, uh, the, the dip in and get your information in a variety of ways is very appealing. Or not so much for teachers to use with an entire class. Some of them can be, but they're more there for um, additional reading when you're studying a particular subject. Um, so of the four books we read today, all of them are heavily illustrated. But uh, you'll notice as you read them that some of them are appropriate for much younger children and others you really do need to wait until there's a certain amount of sophistication. So any teacher who is sharing these books, whether within a whole class or uh, as a, you know, a book set aside for free reading, um, all of these books generally do need uh, a little bit of setup uh, from the teacher or scaffolding as we say now. Um, and interestingly, over the last uh, 20 years or so, there has been a trend in publishing, uh, in, in, well, there's been a trend that every year more and more books are published, um, except for a few times when there is a downturn in the economy and everyone was cutting back. But in general, the makeup of the list that each publisher has, uh, how many books are uh, information books and how many are fiction or folklore or poetry. Um, the trend has been for more fiction and less information books. As Horning points out uh, in her information book chapter in From Cover to Cover, <clears throat> um, there, uh, the, the Jean Fritz had a great deal to do with the transition uh, to the more engaging books. Here's an example of, this is actually a very famous and uh, lauded information book uh, from about um, 50 years ago. And, uh, and this is the kind of book that would have um, a lot of text and kind of all the information you might need to know if you want to know about wild rabbits. Um, and uh, Jean Fritz, uh, in her books about uh, figures in American history, uh, decided that she could figure out a way to make these books factual but much more engaging. And one of the things she did was she would include conversation 
in her books. However, she was very, very uh, uh, hard on herself in that way, in that anything she had in quotes uh, in, in the book uh, was a direct quote from something, obviously not something that Paul Revere said, because who knows exactly what Paul Revere said. There were no tape recorders. Um, but uh, any quotes that are there are from, say, a letter that was written by Paul Revere. Not even, you know, someone writing about him, but really primary source. And uh, that is still really important today. So when you get a book like, uh, here's one called Piano Starts Here. Uh, it's about Art Tatum and uh, written by Robert Andrew Parker, who in fact uh, knew Tatum. And uh, his, this book is told in the first person. And he, uh, Parker says very specifically in his end notes that he has made up a conversation that he uh, believes to be in the spirit of Art Tatum. So that, that's something that you really want to be looking for in any information books, book uh, where there's conversation or there are quotes. Um, are they really quotes? And if they're not, there ought to be something in the back of the book uh, that admits this. Um, another thing I want to talk about is uh, series nonfiction. So these are those books that you find in school libraries all over the place. And they are, uh, they tend to be filled with uh, stock photos and they have, um, Let's see, if you look at their tables of contents, they basically have a, a, a specific, here's the contents on this one. And you can like look at you know where each chapter begins. And then here's another book in this series. And it has exactly the same amount of space for each chapter. So, and these books tend to be written uh, by writers for hire, not by someone who has a particular interest uh, in in this um, uh, in this topic, and so they're just less. You know, they're 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 great for school libraries when there's an assignment that someone needs to have at least three sources uh, in a book about you know say veterinarians. Um, but the fact is that the quality really varies, and you know you look at this series here, which looks pretty similar to this one. Um, but the fact is that this one is actually pretty good. And even though it's all stock photos and, and it's, you know, written to order, it's, um, you know, the, the information they provide is pretty good. Whereas in this series, uh, you won't find these in the guide now because, um, you know, the, these books are just, uh, they just don't give you the kind of information you'd like. Sometimes the captions are misleading. Um, there just tend to be problems with them. And it's really hard to tell just by looking uh, which ones are good and which ones are really not very good. Um, now that's not to say that all series books are bad. Um, think about the Magic School Bus series. Those are terrific. Um, and then uh, Houghton Mifflin has a series called uh, Scientists in the Field. This is the Frog Scientist. Um, and these are uniformly fantastic. And, you know, each one is following a particular scientist. And it's written by someone who has really spent time with that person. And, uh, um, you know, so, so the, and is really interested in that topic. Um, another example, sometimes you'll find series of books by Seymour Simon. And again, he is, they might look a lot like all those other series, you know, lots of photos and, and everything. But Seymour Simon is really trustworthy. And um, in the, the handout, so-called, that we're going to have um, to, to go with the book talks Deborah and I will do tomorrow, uh, that handout will also include a list of authors uh, who do a lot of information books and who really uh, take care. And, and they're really trustworthy in, uh, in doing their, their, uh, those books. Um, it seems uh, that we really need to bring up Common Core, even though it's not adapted in all states. It's, you know, for the most part, it's uh, something that uh, public schools in the U.S. are doing. And one of the things that the Common Core says is that uh, you need to use 
you know, a certain percentage of books are informational texts and that, um, that there needs to be a certain percentage that are trade books, as in, you know, not just the information you get from textbooks. Uh, and of course, also, you, you should know about the Cybert. Um, we, we did post the, who's going to be on the committees uh, for this year. And uh, so some of you will be on our mock Cybert committee, which is looking specifically at information books, uh, in our case, for elementary ages, although the actual Cybert uh, goes all the way up through high school. Okay, so now let's move over to the people whose books we read for today. We have Actual Size by Steve Jenkins. Now, if, you're, uh, if you got this from a library and it doesn't have a book jacket anymore, um, or if you're looking at this online, you may have missed, you will have missed, the fact that the jacket actually includes, um, right along here, uh, it includes a ruler in inches. Um, and of course, uh, again, if you're looking at the book in its actual size, uh, you know, this, this hand right here just invites you to go and, and touch that book. And then, you know, a child would put their hand up against this hand. And, uh, and obviously a child's hand would be smaller than mine. And that, of course, would be their way of measuring and comparing and seeing how they compare uh, to all of these animals. And I kind of think that the, the fact that Jenkins uses uh, collage with a lot of texture, uh, as, as Emily Chu said uh, uh, last week, you know, anytime there's a book with a lot of texture, it, it invites you to put your hand on it. And of course, you can't feel any texture, but in putting your hand on that book, uh, in this case, it helps you to, to measure what's there against the body of the, the actual reader. Um, so Steve Jenkins, uh, born in 1952, uh, he sadly died quite young, uh, just at the end of last year. Uh, he grew up thinking he was going to be a scientist, but eventually he switched over to art. Um, his first book was published in 1994, uh, and he created more than 50 books in all. And you can probably tell from his illustrations that, again, anyone who does collage, this is not fast art. Uh, this takes some doing. Um, he often collaborated with his wife, wife, wife Robin Page, and uh, he came up with ideas based on some of the questions his children would ask. Um, uh, and Jenkins won a number of awards for his books, um, including this one, What Do You Do With a Tail Like This? And so again, this is rather than talking about um, all animals, it's just looking at the tails of some animals and the function that those tails play. Uh, and he did, uh, he has a huge tome called The Animal Book that also won awards. Uh, but he wrote about things other than animals as well. Uh, this is his book about climbing Mount Everest. And uh, this would be definitely for older children than, uh, than actual size. Uh, it's one of those books that has sidebars. And it also has some images that might seem to be a little bit uh, gruesome and grisly because it shows a man's, you know, hand with frostbite on it. But again, it's, it's you know, got that remove of not being photographs but being illustrations. So you can kind of show those, those grisly things uh, without grossing people out so much. Um, so then uh, we've got uh, Dave the Potter. And uh, I have to admit that this book is on our syllabus um, more for the illustrations than for the text. It was not universally well-reviewed because people felt that Hill's uh, text, you know, was maybe a little bit lacking. Um, but Collier is one of my favorite illustrators, and he has won a number of awards. So briefly, Laban Carrick Hill, the author, uh, has, uh, he teaches at the Pine Manor, Pine Manor Writing Program for children's books. Um, and he also writes uh, poetry and books for adults, um, including a book about the Harlem Renaissance, uh, which was quite well received, and uh, some other biographies. And uh, even though he himself is white, uh, he tends to be drawn toward um, books about African Americans. Uh, Brian Collier, uh, who you know uh, a great deal about because you have read those three articles about Dave the Potter 
including the one about uh, Brian Collier, um, or by him. Uh, so uh, Collier grew up in Maryland and uh, had a very early interest in art, which his family encouraged. Um, in fact, as a teenager, he won uh, an art competition. Um, one of the th interesting things about him is that uh, there, there's something called the Harlem Horizon Studio, um, which is uh, part of Harlem Hospital, and it provides uh, workspace materials for self-taught artists. And uh, he was the director of that program for 12 years, uh, and now he uh, volunteers there. You know, when, once his uh, book career really took off, he cut back on some of his other activities. Um, his first children's book came out in 2000, uh, and uh, he received the Coretta Scott King uh, New Talent Award that year. Um, and he primarily illustrates books written by other people and almost universally illustrates biographies of African Americans. And um, a couple of mine of the books of his that I have have gone missing. Um, but uh, he's probably most well known uh, for a book called Martin's Big Words by Doreen Rappaport. And uh, I'll show you that uh, cover there. It might look familiar to you. Uh, here's one I do have. Uh, after Martin's Big Words, he kind of became also known for uh, creating books with uh, wordless covers. This does have, um, you know, if you look very carefully, you'll see some text. Um, but, you know, he has a really recognizable style. Uh, he tends to, you know, do a lot with showing motion, and again, it's a really mixed media, uh, is, is what he always does. Um, okay, oh, uh, now I do make, want to make sure that I also talk to you, um, not just about the people who wrote this book, but about the subject. Uh, Dave the Potter, who is now more commonly known as David Drake. And, um, of course, he, he did really live. Uh, no one knows exactly when he was born. Um, but he did uh, live about eight years after uh, emancipation. Um, over his lifetime, he, it's estimated that he made uh, more than 40,000 pots. Um, and uh, he was especially known for being able to make really large pots. So uh, this one here, for example... Um, you can see scale because there's someone holding it. Um, but some of the pots he made uh, held up to 40 gallons, which would be more than three times uh, the pot that you can see here. So for a sense of what, how much 40 gallons is, you think about those big black um, trash bags. So if you were to take one of those and fill that with water, that's 30 gallons. So even larger than that. Kind of amazing. And then, of course, uh, the texts that he wrote on his pots uh, are also what make his pots especially collectible. And there have been a number of exhibitions, and uh, his, his pottery now uh, has sold uh, in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, okay, next up we have our book Feathers, and uh, of course Sarah Brannan will be visiting us. We hope to get Melissa Stewart also. But uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, Harvard will not pay honorariums for, uh, for uh, speakers, for visiting speakers. And uh, the thing is that for most people who create children's books, um, school visits are a large part of their, um, uh, their income. And there are a number of people who just refuse to do any kind of school visit without being paid. And Melissa did once uh, visit our class, but... Uh, she, since there, has really is standing up for her principles. And I say, you know, go for it, because I, I completely agree with that, that uh, they should certainly be paid for their appearances. So the people who are coming to speak to us this year are not being paid. They're doing this, you know, just out of kindness. And, uh, and of course, I owe them all a favor. Um, so, anyway. Talking about the people who... Uh, created the book Feathers. So um, Melissa Stewart and Sarah Brennan both live in Massachusetts. Uh, Melissa Stewart has degrees in biology and science journalism, and she is the author of more than 180 information books for children. Uh, so yeah, she's one of the most prolific um, science book creators for children. 
Uh, she's won a number of awards for the bo these books. Um, Feathers uh, was an ALA notable book and won, uh, was a Sibyls winner, Sibylis, sorry, Sibylis winner, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and their most recent book, uh, which is uh, Summertime Sleepers, Animals That Estivate, as opposed to Hibernate, uh, that just won a cyber honor, which is a very big deal for them. And uh, that is their third book together. Uh, this is their second one, which I do own, Seashells More Than a Home. And like Feathers, uh, all of these books uh, provide information in three ways. So you can read uh, the, the, the large text, and then uh, the smaller text, and then the little bits of information um, that uh, come with the little inset illustrations. Um, and then we have uh, Sarah Brannan, uh, who we're going to know better by the end of the day, Wednesday. Um, she actually got her uh, undergrad degree from Harvard and then went, went on to get a, an MFA. Uh, she started working on Breaking Into Children's Books in 2001, and her first book, Uncle Bobby's Wedding, uh, was published about five years later. Um, and I actually got to know her before her books were even published, which is one of the reasons she's willing to come and talk to us. Uh, we, we used to sing in a choir together. Anyway, uh, her very first book, Uncle Bobby's Wedding, uh, is about uh, two male guinea pigs who get married. It's, it's a book about uh, being a flower girl, which is what she really wanted to write about. And uh, she'll tell us more about how this came to be. Uh, and interestingly, there's a new edition of this book, uh, which has a, a different illustrator. And Sarah herself is, uh, is not gay. And in fact, uh, people, because of this book and all the, the attention it got, people kind of assumed that she was. And she actually had to officially come out as straight um, when she was asked to appear on a talk show in San Francisco which was specifically for the LGBTQ uh, uh, community. Um, well, let me see, what else do I want to say? Uh, oh yeah, and, and then she's done other books as well. Uh, she has a series about Madame Martine. She's also illustrated a number of uh, information books for other people. Um, let's see, oh yes, and then we have, um, oh goodness, where, oh, Okay, well, the other book we have, of course, is Voice of Freedom. I'll just insert a little photo of that. You know what it looks like. Um, and uh, this is written by Carol Boston Weatherford, who is just an exceptional writer of information books for children. Um, and uh, she primarily does uh, picture book biographies uh, written in verse, uh, which is actually very hard to do. Any of you who've tried to do that uh, should, would know that. Uh, her ver first book came out in uh, 1995 <clears throat> called uh, Juneteenth Jamboree, and um, <clears throat> her books cover many topics, um, <clears throat> but uh, primarily around uh, black history. So books about slavery, about Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era, and uh, she's won uh, two NAACP Image Awards and um, has also won Coretta Scott King Author Awards. Um, here's an example of another of her books, Freedom in Congo Square. Uh, this was, as you can see, this won some awards as well, uh, including a Seibert. And um, this was illustrated by R. Gregory Christie, who I think is really terrific. And um, this is uh, Freedom in Congo Square. It, it's a book that goes through all the days of the week um, that, you know, uh, what, what they, what, uh, these, you know, this group of enslaved people, what they do each day of the week <clears throat> until finally, um, on, um, where to go, Sundays, where are the Sundays, um, anyway, finally, on Sundays, they all congregate and gather in, um, um, Congo Square. This, this book takes place in New Orleans, and those of you who know New Orleans would be familiar with Congo Square. Um, anyway, and then uh, Aqua Holmes, who I was really hoping would be able to visit us. Uh, she's another person I've known for a long time, but um, she's been incredibly busy this year. So uh, 
this is very understandable that she wasn't able to visit us. Um, uh, Aqua grew up in the Roxbury part of Boston. Uh, she got her BA from Mass Art, Massachusetts College of Art, the only uh, public art school in the country. Um, when I knew her back in the 90s, uh, we were both working as freelance graphic designers. Um, and then she also started to work at Mass Art, uh, where she originated something called Spark the Artmobile, uh, which goes around to uh, neighborhoods mostly in Roxbury and uh, provides ways for people to just get together and make art. Um, and even back when I knew her, before she herself uh, was creating her own art, um, she uh, managed a gallery uh, which featured art by uh, Boston area African American artists. Um, and uh, Voice of Freedom was Aqua's very first book. Uh, she had only recently started uh, creating her own art and uh, one of the editors at Candlewick uh, went to uh, an exhibition and saw Aqua's art and asked if she'd ever thought about uh, illustrating children's books. Now this is really unusual in this day and age. Uh, and as it turns out, she had kind of been thinking that she would like to do that, um, but hadn't really gotten around to making that big push that you have to do, of like creating a website and printing postcards and all of this stuff. So she really, that was really a lucky break. But of course, you know, in some ways luck had nothing to do with it because she's incredibly talented. And uh, I'm so glad to say that the wider world is, uh, has really caught on to uh, her abilities as an artist. And in fact, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, gave her a solo exhibition earlier uh, in uh, uh, the second half of 2021. It, it just closed uh, about a month ago. So, um, sorry, I'm kind of getting away, getting carried away talking about Aqua because I think she's so terrific. Um, and even though she's only done a few books so far, uh, I think that every single book that she's illustrated has won some sort of an award. Uh, and uh, here's another example of another uh, one of her books. This is uh, by uh, Kwame Alexander, a, a very new and well-known uh, YA author for children. And, uh, and again, it's, you know, this is her signature style. Um, <clears throat> what have I got? I've got one of these marked here. Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, this is a poem about um, Gwendolyn Brooks. And uh, there she is. So you can see, I just, I just love, love, love her art so much. Um, anyway, so um, does that take us all the way through? I think it actually does. Uh, as usual, I'm sure I forgot something, but um, uh, but you know we'll we'll pick it up again uh, in class. So that's it for now, and uh, uh, sometime uh, on Monday, uh, keep an eye out for the book talk video that Deborah and I are, are going to record soon. Thanks a lot. See you in class.